Manohu, everyone. Um, my name is Tashina Parker. I am the social impact producer for this project, um, Chishkale Blessing of the Acorn, which is a video that is an accumulation of a project that um, has been in the works for many years. Um, today we have um, all, all our different collaborators here with us. And um, I am Miwa Kampayut from Yosemite and Kashaya Pomo as well. And I normally reside in Yelamu, occupied territory of the Ohlone people. I'm currently in Teotitlan de Valle in Oaxaca, um, the land of the Cloud people, the Zapotecs. And I want to welcome you all here today. So today on our panel, before we start um, the video, we have Stella Edelman and Dance Mission, who are the um, funder, the grant writers and the producers for this short video. We have Bernadette Smith who is uh, doing the dance in the video and also she works with tribal environmental activism with her tribe. We have Canyon Sayers Rude, who's cultural carrier and also cultural consultant for this, this short film. Victoria Montano, who is a land steward at Sogarate Giltrack Farm. Uh, Rulon Tongan, choreography for the dance in the video, and also artistic director of Dancing Earth. Esme Olivia, who composed the original music in the video, and also um, Linda Migraine, who uh, is the director of the video. So um, I want to welcome you all here today. And in order to uh, watch the video in a smooth way, we're going to go ahead and drop the link to you in, in the chat. This is one thing that does connect us all, all California Indians. We all know that this acorn is something that we all share. They think that these, uh, these methods and these traditions are just traditions and history, but they're not. They're life skills. Oh yeah, okay, this is fun one. Chishkale. That's what the, we call the acorn tree. That's the name of it in our language. So it's um, translated to beautiful tree. Gets me grooving. <laughs> I never had access to any land. It's only been since I became a part of Sigorte two and a half years ago where I actually got to put my hands in the dirt for the first time. In the way that I account that I am a California native person in the 21st century, I recognize that it could be a challenge to honor my ancestors in the old way. On our reservation, we don't have indigenous plants growing like you think they would. Seeing what's happening here, and even in this urban area, and you guys are able to grow stuff and you know put things in the earth and, and actually see something, you know, these medicines growing. It's very inspiring. When I realized the tanuk tree was the acorn tree, and I started reading more, and I realized the fight that the non-natives were upset about was just the fire hazard. Mm. And it wasn't about, well, that's like a sacred tree for us, you know, that these people are spraying herbicide. And it just made me envision the story of the acorn in this dance form to bring awareness. It's a real story. It's not a creation story that somebody told them, this is what's happening right now. This is for my family. Ka kan. Anatama Adawan. Nata Kawi. Bele Wadu. Bumuchidu. Bele Wadu. I will do as much as I can to honor my ancestors to the best of my ability 
and to attempt to be a good ancestor in training. I have to feed my children. My father needs the spiritual nourishment. This is how I love my family. They can depend on me. I honor them. Your protection plant. They honor me. Is this a medicinal plant? This is also a medicinal plant and it's related to chamomile. Um, the way that you will tell the difference is by the leaves. I'll pass this gift to the next generation. Yeah, we. This is how I honor Creator for the blessing of the acorn. But nobody does it like, like the coastal. Oh, no. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> They're not quite like us. Thanks everyone. Um, hopefully you all had a chance to catch that. And if you didn't, um, you can also tune back in and watch again after the conversation. And we will be sharing that link with who registered for this webinar as well. So um, thank you everybody for your kind comments. And that little short video, which was only five minutes was about two years in the making and possibly and you could argue longer bernadette smith has been working with food sovereignty and preserving the tan oak acorn in her area of Puerto Rico, pomo territory for many years and so this is just a little snippet of the collaborative work that we have all done together and everyone here on this panel um, we've all worked with each other in this project and in projects beyond this. So um, as creative people and indigenous people, we all have different um, talents to share and different um, perspectives. And also collaboratively, when we work together, we're able to create just, you know, this is just a small little taste of the type of work that we do together. So you saw dance in this movie or this film. You saw um, work with native food sovereignty, both in rural areas and in urban areas. And also there is original music that is composed to this as well. So I'm gonna go ahead and pass it off to Bernadette Smith and she's gonna tell you a little bit about her work and her part in this film. Um, so Bernadette, uh, go for it. Um, hi, uh, thank you everybody who's watched the video. Um, I just want to give a special thanks to uh, all the other panelists that are here and thank you for everything you've done. Um, so I'm Coastal Pomo. I come from the Manchester Point Arena band as well as Kashaya band. Um, I've lived here for many years and um, you know, my work with the acorn started about six, six years ago. I learned about sudden oak death, which is a disease plaguing the California oaks, um, particularly here in the coastal areas, we have the tan oak species. So that one will be um, pretty much extinct within you know, the next 50 years or so. And uh, so it's just basically something that caught my attention and it, it provoked the interest for me about what I can do to prevent this from happening or to help my people um, understand the importance of the acorn and, and to try to revitalize that tradition in, in my own area. Um, but working with Rulan and, and understanding uh, how she uses contemporary indigenous dance to tell stories and to bring awareness to issues uh, in native communities, I thought would be a beautiful collaboration. And I thought the story of the acorn and um, how we gathered and, and basically, I'd like to talk a little bit about the dance itself um, for a few minutes. Um, I'm a little nervous and I apologize. <laughs> um, 
it's just been a real blessing to be able to work with everybody and to make this video uh, the girl and the young lady that was dancing with me her name is shirley carrillo she was very um active with me and raising awareness about sudden oak death and and bringing our community together this year would have been the fifth year that we revitalized the acorn ceremony that would happen here in point arena we were able to obtain um i I don't want to say the land back, but we were able to gain access to a federally um, owned land base that's here in Point Arena that hasn't been used in over 30 years. And we're able to have our ceremony there. Um, every year it gets bigger and bigger and we invite the community to come and see so that people can understand that, uh, you know, the importance of the Tan Oak. There's a, not just sudden oak death, we have forestry companies coming in and not even forestry companies, landowners as well, just um, using this uh, herbicide in the process of it's called hack and squirt, where they kill the trees from the inside out. Um, so we have not only sudden oak death happening, but we also have these forestry companies killing uh, the tan oaks in, in mass numbers. So, you know, trying to, keep this tradition alive and not only keep it alive but revitalize it's been a very uh it's been challenging so reaching out and and you know finding different ways that we can share this story and tell this message to people across you know the united states and all through california it's been a real um beautiful thing to be able to work with dancing earth and dance mission and and Segorite and uh, yeah, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Bernadette. Um, we're going to go ahead and pass it to Canyon. Canyon, um, tell us about your work on this project. Mishmin Tuhis, Countercott Canyon, Coyote Woman, Sarah's Roots. Are you able to see me? There we go. <laughs> Uh, my name is Canyon Coyote Woman. I come from Indian Canyon Nation, daughter of tribal chairwoman Anne Marie Sayers. And Indian Canyon is in Mutsunaloni territory. And our nonprofit is called Coast to Know and Indian Research. Because I am a cultural representative of my community, there are times that my coyote wily self is very proactive in reminding people that it is important to honor truth and history. And in the film, my quote is actually, I will do whatever I can, whenever I can, for as long as I can, to honor truth and history, to honor my elders, to the, uh, elders and ancestors to the best of my ability, and to be a good ancestor in training. That being said, I feel blessed that I've had many opportunities to work with Dancing Earth and Dance Mission Theater and so many community members, beautiful artists. And when I heard about Bernadette's story, I was really motivated in saying we, we should really celebrate the story and get it out there because there are many times that I, as an Indigenous person in the Bay Area, there are, are communities and businesses and agencies who want Indigenous peoples to be involved in possibly land acknowledgements and other gatherings. However, they either want Indigenous peoples to do things the old way or a blessing or, or they want the Native to do the song and dance routine in some form or fashion. And it's beautiful to talk about this generation and this community, how we are together and how we connect to the best of our ability to honor our elders, to honor our kinship and relationship to the earth and our responsibility to be good stewards. So I was really motivated in um, trying to get um, a grant and, and community members like motivated because I don't have the skills. So I was like, please, I, I, I will do anything. I, let's, let's get them together. So I was just really happy to attempt to be a catalyst in bringing community together for this. So I, I love Dancing Earth. Uh, Rulan is so amazing. Tashina, you are organizing that. <laughs> and I'm just so honored to celebrate this opportunity of this film, uh, the screening, because, you know, there's going to be beautiful projects in the future. And I'm honored to be here. I am Mutsun Ohlone and Chumash with a little bit of Yeromut ancestry. And currently I am in Huchin in the East Bay. I come from Indian Canyon. 
the only federally recognized Indian country between Sonoma and Santa Barbara along Central Coastal California. And I'm happy to be a part of this project. And I'm going to pass it off to Vicki. You there? <laughs> yeah, thanks, Canyon. Um, thank you, everybody. Um, yeah, um, my name's Victoria. Um, I'm Yaki Nashika, Two Spirit. Um, and the way that I became involved with the film is just through building relationships, um, through working with uh, the Sigourte Land Trust, which I've been a part of for the last um, two and a half, going on three years now. Um, and through that work, I've been able to um, build relationships, like I mentioned. And um, I happened to meet Tashina through one of those um, you know, through one of our native organizations, you know, we're all about working with community here and in, in the urban rest, what I like to call it. Um, and through Sigorte, I was able to actually like have my first experience of actually putting my hands in the dirt like I talk, talk about in the film. Um, I never had any kind of land access and even then, even then I'm still a, um, I'm still a person that occupies um, stolen land you know and i'm born and raised here in east oakland um, um its traditional name is the village of huchin um and you know it's an honor for me to be able to be of service to the lashana Ohlone, um and to be able to reconnect and reawaken and uh, participate in land rematriation um and to be able to be under the leadership of karina Gu and janella larose and um, their daughters, uh, Daisha, you know, who's working really hard to do um, language revitalization and, you know, who's able, you know, we're all able to do this work together and support each other and support Ohlone people. And also to, you know, like keep talking about, to keep talking about Ohlone people in the present tense um, and let everybody else know that they're still here. Um, so thank you for being, letting me be a part of this film, um, short film, Bernadette, it was, beautiful meeting you and thank you so much for your work it's so necessary um we need people like you um tishina and everybody else canyon um, and i'm gonna pass it on to um roland thank you guys greetings um it's a it's an honor and pleasure to be here in amongst community i'll just um bring in the part that i'm in service of here um, I think it connects to my matriarchal lineage. My grandparents are buried at the foot of the Golden Gate Bridge. They um, were people who shared the Pacific. They came across the from Luzon Island, and um, I've been, you know, in more recent years, I've met up with uh, Pomo people through the Banka Canoe Project, who said this is the um, we share the waters. So in that way, I feel kinship but I also need to um, take responsibility to move out from being, uh, an, a, even as an indigenous person, a, an uninvited settler, and to use the gifts that I have to be able to um, make good relations on the California land that my mother's side of the family have um, uh, made in, in, as their home. So, um, you know, I, I, I think of the, the role of choreography, and to me is, I use the word dream visioning, and people might have, you know, an idea of what that is and and where those dreams might come from. I think maybe it's perhaps this dream came from the California Earth herself and um, came first. There were various strands, which were mostly in the form of amazing women and um, the dream might have been happening. And then there's different things that sort of uh, coordinate so that it can come to life um, for me. Part of it was uh, Emily Johnson, who's here today. She's an amazing native Alaskan woman. And she had met the beautiful young dancer you see, Shirley. And she said, you know, Rulan, I know you're in that area a lot. I'd like to commission a, a dance for Shirley to inspire her and, you know, encourage her. And, you know, I, I, I go into my intuition a lot. And I thought, well, what could inspire her and encourage her more? I mean, I, I'm going to bring what I can from the outside but really it's about um, the women in her own community that can be the true inspiration, be the oak tree for her beautiful acorn. And uh, that person was known to me already, Bernadette, met through the amazing Tashina who was helping coordinate it and getting her friends to host us on their floor so we could all make it happen. Um, these are all the behind the scenes stories that, you know, the, the things that we have to put together so that these dances can emerge so beautifully. 
And um, so like all these strands started to weave together as a basket. And, you know, I, I think my role was to watch and listen with every part of my being. So the choreography is not, you know, someone coming in and saying, oh, here's what I want to see, or let's take this and use it as an inspiration for choreography. Bernadette had a very clear mission, which is that she wanted people to know this story. So that isn't about abstraction or, you know, it's about something that's very real and very specific. And I wanted Shirley's little friends, her grandpa, I wanted people, people from the community to, to see it and be able to tune in like, oh, that must be the part when they're grinding. You know, some of it is very much just coming from watching Bernadette's movements as she's telling the story. Many people who are bilingual also tend to be trilingual. So if they have familiarity with more than one language, they tend to remember their, you know, uh, it, most indigenous way of communicating, which is talking through hands. So a lot of this comes from um, Bernadette's incredible expression. And um, on top of that, Shirley had an interest in, um, you know, sort of upright kind of uh, elegant dance style. And so I tried to bring in part of her hopes and dreams for that as well. So just really trying to bring in my skills to facilitate. So it was just very um, honored for the process. And I'm gonna be passing along to Esme, who is not only the composer, but very much involved. Um, she's a dancing earth artist. So she's an incredible dancer. She was coaching Bernadette and Shirley and um, uh, working on the educational component, how to translate this into fun exercises for the Pomo youth. So she's an incredible artist in every way. And uh, Esme, turn it, pass it on to you. Hello, thank you, Ruman. Um, Yes, my name is Esme Olivia. I am currently in occupied Tiwa lands known as Albuquerque, New Mexico. And um, I've been really honored to be a part of Dancing Earth for the past three and a half years. And I got to be part of the making of this dance. Um, I came in a little after the process had begun and I uh, got to help model some of the movements, so just kind of learn the dance with Shirley and Bernadette and model those movements for Shirley, which was really fun. And I was really honored to meet Bernadette and get to sing with her and just learn more about the story of Chishkale, the beautiful tree, um, this nourisher for so many, for um, those human and beyond human. And so I, um, I love to learn different languages and um, I was lucky enough to have Bernadette be willing to, to show me some resources. And so I can, um, I'll share in the chat after I finish speaking a link to um, a Kashaya Pomo uh, online dictionary where there are words with visuals as well as sentences. And they're spoken by um, a, uh, the words are spoken by three different elders and um, whose names are in the credits. And I will, sorry, I'm having internet issues. So I was planning on using both screens and I only have one. So um, forgive me for that, uh, please. And there was another resources that, that had whole sentences spoken by two other elders. And so I used those resources to learn some words in Kashaya Pomo, words for acorn and beautiful tree, and for all of the, um, for various tools that are used in the processing of the acorn, because as is illustrated in the dance, there's a lot of work that has to happen to go from having an acorn on the ground that is gathered to then being made into the super nourishing superfood of to'o, the acorn mush. And so um, I'll just say the words in my humble, non Kashaya Pomo speaking accent. Um, I say, or we start with ama, which is the ground or the earth, and then ahka, which is water. And that earth and that water, um, combines with hada, the sun, to help nourish a tree, which is kale. And then, um, so I'm saying, I go, ama, ahka, kale, hada, to all of these beings, we are your children, yake nataya. 
and Yake Nataya was a phrase taught to me by Shirley Carrillo's father, Clarence Carrillo, um, who Bernadette was kind enough to have me meet and um, learn some phrases from and check some pronunciation with. And from there, there's the word Yahui, which is thank you, giving thanks. And then um, I talk about Bidu, this is the acorn, Chishkale, beautiful tree, Tanok, Iso, seed. So um, acorn, seed of the beautiful tree, the Tanok. Um, you are Ma'a, your food, Bak'e, for Shibashi, the animals, your food for the animals. Ma'a, Bak'e, Achayachma, you are the food for we the people. And Achayachma, from my understanding, is, is more like a word that would be said by a Kashaya Pomo person for the people, the Kashaya Pomo people. Um, so I'm just a, I'm a non Kashaya Pomo representative. I forgot to say um, in my introduction that I uh, grew up here in Tiwa uh, Lands, Albuquerque. My dad is from Holland and my mom is from Mexico. So I'm a mixed mestiza peace treaty. <laughs> yes, and Ruban is doing the hand motion of the two weaving. Um, so yeah, those are some of the words. We have some, there were, and then you'll hear I'm singing Bidu, Buhkal, Kolo, Dokul, Ahka, Che, E, To, O. And so all those words, it's like Bidu, Acorn. And then it goes into the basket to gather. And then it goes into the mortar basket. And it's ground with the Dukul, the pestle. And then there's water that, that, um, is the word bland? No, the, there's a word for it's cleaned of all these different, I think it's tannins, maybe Bernadette can clarify, but you have to really um, run a lot of water through all that acorn, ground it up, and then um, it goes into a cooking basket, and then it turns to acorn mush. So those are some translations. I'll share the link so you can check out. There's some really it's a beautiful resource that was put together by um, the, some folks working from the linguistics department at University of Pennsylvania. And um, yeah, I am just ho hopefully it can help promote learning the language and the other voice that you'll hear on the track um, speaking in English is Bernadette's voice just doing, I have to feed my family. This is nourishment for my father. My father needs a spiritual nourishment. So I'm really glad I got to um, help create this track and work with Bernadette. And uh, yeah, it was one of my first projects producing in Logic. So I got to learn a lot along the way. Um, yeah, Bele Wadu means everyone come. Bumu Chidu, it's time to eat. So thank you for everyone responding to that call um, of Bele Wadu to be here together on this Zoom panel. And yay, all right. Um, I'll pass it along to Linda. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you all for coming. Um, yeah, as um, others mentioned, I directed this film. Um, uh, and my colleague, partner, business partner, Ethan, um, was the cinematographer, um, the cameraman. And um, when I say directed this film, um, you know, it really was about holding space for Bernadette and Shirley to perform and for Bernadette and Vic to meet and have a dialogue about um, you know, plants and, and conservation and, and all the good things mentioned um, by those that spoke before me. Um, but really, uh, we're just so um, grateful to also be of service to, to all this work that, um, that these amazing women have done to, to create indigenous, contemporary indigenous culture. And we're just so happy to, to be there to witness that and, and put it into film. And I noticed that someone in the comments um, asked if they could share the film. And I just made the Vimeo link public. So please feel free to share 
um, widely, um, that would be amazing to to spread this, you know, get to have as many people as possible see this beautiful dance and learn more about um, California Native heritage. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. Um, Bernadette, would you like to talk a little bit more about the um, your the acorn ceremony that you started and what that ceremony is about and also um, how people can support you in your efforts um, to preserve tan oak acorn in your area? Um, sure. So um, can you repeat what the first part you just said? Um, how can people support your work to preserve tan oak acorn and tell us a little bit about the ceremony? I know that this year it has been uh, postponed or canceled or um, um, maybe there's a smaller gathering. So can you tell us about what's happening this year in the face of COVID? Yeah, um, so this year we decided not to go ahead with um, having the ceremony this year in the public uh, aspect of that. Like the, normally uh, I invite the community because I just kind of wanted to um, to promote, it was all more of an effort to show these forestry companies and the Air Force landowners or occupiers um, that we, you know, we do celebrate the acorn, that the acorn is sacred to our people. And if they don't believe us, well, they can come and see, you know, that's kind of what that was about. We wanted people to come and witness for themselves what that looked like. Well, what does it mean to celebrate the acorn? Well, you know, we come and we dance and we pray and we give thanks to the creator for for this gift that he's given us for so many years. So basically that's what happens this year. It, won't be happening but we will be having a smaller gathering at our sacred uh house so it's called the round house so we're hoping to have um maybe just the people from our reservation particularly there this year um unfortunately we won't be able to have the whole community come there but we're still going to do what we have to do we are going to be able to pray and, and give thanks and celebrate and part of that celebration um the end of each celebration like that or or roundhouse ceremony is the feast and so we'll be able to do that and i've been looking at the acorns here and i think that the acorns are looking really good i know the fires and everything have been happening but in some strange way it almost seems to be feeling the acorns you know helping them so you know, with everything bad happening, and I know it seems like it's really, really, everybody's really stressed and, you know, concerned about the fires, but when it comes to the acorns and what's happening with them, it, it's actually looking a little bit beneficial um, on, on, you know, on the acorns behalf. So I try to keep a positive outlook on that. Um, so the, the ceremony should happen this year, and, and it's been, it hasn't happened in Point Arena for over, I believe, 70 years. It hasn't happened. Well, my dad's 70, and he's never seen one. He knew about it, but never seen one here. So being able to bring that back and, and start that again, was it was an honor. You know, how Canyon was saying to honor her ancestors and be an ancestor in training, you know, that's kind of what I feel like I'm doing is, is doing my job as a Poma woman, you know, and doing what I can to keep this tradition alive. And like I said in the in the song that Esme was talking about, you know, my father needs this spiritual nourishment. I took my father to see a shaman here in Kashaya, one of the last doctors there, dreamers. And, you know, he told my dad, you need to eat acorn. My dad's very ill. And he told my dad, this is spiritual food, not just, you know, nourishment, for our bodies but spiritual nourishment so when you hear those words and i get a little emotional talking about it it's part of the reason why i keep pushing so much for you know the survival of the acorn not only for my father but you know for the other elders out there and and for me and for my kids and for you and your kids so you know it's been a um, very emotional journey finding my place here, finding, you know, my job here on earth while I'm here, the things I'm supposed to be doing and 
for the creator and you know acorn is just that's just where it's at for me and and i'm really happy and i i seen emily johnson on here and i just wanted to let you know that you know um seeing your play or your performance catalyst it was really the beginning of of everything and you know the storytelling and just the impact that i seen that it had on me you know bringing these indigenous stories to to uh for people to see it and also um daystar seeing her work you know and the impact i seen that it had on me and that's just coming from a young girl from the reservation that never seen any kind of you know contemporary dancing like that I, it does make you feel something very strange inside <laughs> so i wanted to bring that to the pomo youth here and they were actually very um accepting of it they did they you know they did a second piece to this one that you guys seen today um it's more of a play about the destruction of the acorn and and the killing of the acorn and sudden oak death and you know um and hopefully in the future that'll be something everybody can see as well and rulon you know helped us do that and so that that's just a little bit about that thank you thanks bernadette that was that was wonderful i want to acknowledge um Galia, who said in the comments, with the fires going on and knowing the fires help tree cones explode and reseed the earth. So with the acorn, um, that the acorn will be reseeded to the earth through the fires. And so that's part of um, just the land stewardship that fire naturally had a, an occurrence and a place in um, indigenous communities. And I know that right now we're going through a lot of trauma in California with a lot of the fires and the Creek Fire, which is in my territory. Um, encroaching in on Yosemite. It's scary when these happen, but also there's a rebirth in, um, in the destruction as well. And talking about the dance, so there was a question from Nina, um, and this is a question open to all dancers who contributed to this project, but the question is, as uninvited settlers on unceded Ohlone lands in the East Bay, how might we bring ourselves as dancers to honor the acorn, the tan oak trees, and this land where we live? It's a question for me. It could be a question for you um, oh. as, yeah, or any of the dancers that are in this. So okay. how, how, how might you talked about, um, Bernadette, you talked about bringing this dance to Pomo youth in your area and how contemporary dance made you feel a certain way. Um, maybe just elaborate a little bit on that feeling of um, experiencing contemporary dance and telling, telling story and then also maybe traditional dance and how they relate and uh, maybe how they're different. Well definitely um how they relate when when we dance traditionally it's in prayer you know and that's kind of what i told the kids to do when they were learning this dance and 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 moving like that i said you know remember we're dancing we're doing this so that we can we can spread this message about what's happening that people will learn about what's happening you know so when we're dancing just like when we're dancing and praying in the roundhouse when we're on you know in front of these people or on the stage or wherever it's happening you, know, you need to still be in that same spiritual mindset because when we're dancing we're praying and you know we performed it at the uh, native american art show they had here in Guala, california that's right where we live uh, it was hosted by eric wilder a local artist here from kashaya and he had an art expo for native artists and we brought it there and a few of the elders from kashaya were actually in tears you know crying and telling me you know like thank you for for doing this and it made them feel you know i know the feeling what they're talking about when you can't put words to it exactly you know it, but it's that prayer it's that spirituality and that's the big difference that I see with this type of dance, with this type of work and message behind it. And, uh, you know, like I said, seeing that with Emily and Rulan and Daystar, and, you know, I was hoping that what the kids did would be able to ignite that same emotion in, in our people. And it did. And, you know, I have, 
elders, like I said, tell me and testified to that happening. So even if, you know, it never gets performed again, whatever happens in the future, you know, just hearing that and, and knowing that it actually did happen in that way, you know, it, it was, um, it was beautiful for me to hear that. Thanks, Bernadette. Um, yeah, there, it is such a deep expression of contemporary um, dance and how we relate to ourselves as Indigenous people, both drawing from tradition and history and ancestors and teaching and prayer, and then also how we express ourselves in um, contemporary ways. Rulon, would you like to elaborate a little bit on that? You know, I feel like um, it's always what I was saying about listening and um you know like maybe letting people know what you have to offer and then listening for how you can be of service i think you know close to home there uh nina because i know you're in in hayward you've got sogorote which is an incredible native woman-led initiative and there might be i i know that uh you know karina blessed uh, a group of dancers i was working with at uc berkeley by saying hey we're trying to protect a shell mound um, as an ancestral ceremonial site. But if you come and dance your dances as a new ceremony there, then it's in continual use as ceremony. And that was after, you know, some relationship building and all of that. So there might be ways to um, grow that relation, listen in for cues close by, and, you know, that starts to connect you with the whole line of incredible Native artists and activists and, um, you know, when can dance be of service? Like when, when Bernadette says, I'm having an acorn festival and I need you to come and dance around an oak tree, you know, it, it, it's uh, starting these relationships so you can be of service when the time comes. Yeah, we. Uh, yeah, we have. Um, so we had a question about food sovereignty and um, is food sovereignty movement a part of the tribal youth ambassadors of the California Indian Cultural Museum movement and acorn bites? Um, that's a really great question and officially no we are not but we collaborate a lot with um, with them they're great supporters of all of our personal work and then all of our work with Dancing Earth and then we we are looking to always collaborate with the um, California um, cultural or the, the museum in Santa Rosa and also want to put a shout out there for their acorn bites they've been doing youth work up there for a while to create these really freaking delicious tasty acorn bites and I know Canyon worked on this so Canyon um, can you elaborate a little bit on your participation in that project with the acorn bites and then also tell us a little bit about um, the food sovereignty work and how that's related and kind of ties into this project um, definitely I I recall being um, part of a few conversations as a panelist around food sovereignty, especially around acorns. Uh, with with those youth, I feel lucky to have witnessed a lot of their beautiful work. I know there was a struggle with logo and packaging, and so I believe I was part of the running up on uh, being a graphic designer for a logo at one point in time, and then waiting on packaging opportunities, which uh, Western settler colonialism gets in the way all the time. That being said, food sovereignty is so very important when it comes to decolonizing our diet, re-indigenizing how we approach our methodology of being good stewards of the earth, and the considerations about how we make the decisions about how we impact lives. When we think about, well, I can offer a small story. My mother, she, she said, uh, when I was a young girl, I was about five, she had a guest and she told him we're going to have lunch and my daughter's going to make a wonderful salad. And she goes, go, uh, go out Canyon and do it the right way. And this gentleman is like wondering what, what did she mean? He's looking out the window and he's looking at every window and he's looking for a garden. And he asks, I don't, I don't see a garden. Where's your garden? Where'd you, where'd you send your daughter? Right then I came back with a big basket full of edible roughage. I had Indian lettuce, or some people call it miner's lettuce, chickweed, and uh, watercrust. I even got some bay leaves because I was going to make some tea. And my mother says, it's all around us. And he asked, what does it mean to do it the right way? And my mother has always taught me if I have tobacco, or prayer, or a song, or even some of my hair, Nowadays, I even offer it a little compost tea uh, to make an offering to this relative, to thank this life lived and the gift given, to consider 
how I might engage in an ethical, sustainable harvest, to not take from the beginning sprouts and to not take from the last and to not take too much. And so that being said, it's really important that when we talk about decolonization, we talk about re-indigenization, that we are conscious about our decisions, not only how they impact ourselves, our family, our environment, but seven generations in the future. How is it that our actions and words might be considered? Because sometimes it means saying no, because many of us are in this capitalistic, materialistic, disposable society that is not conscious of how it has an impact and how that ripple effect impacts our next generations. And so when we talk about food sovereignty, indigenous peoples have been practicing this for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. Same thing when it comes to land stewardship with fire. The rain is coming with these fires and it's painful that these are catastrophic fires because we need to remember that our ancestors, our elders have had a respectful relationship with fire and would tend the land with fire to bring in the environmental and the ecological diversity to bring in those seeds, to bring in and strengthen the bark. Because when you think about the sudden oak death disease, Western settler science is so focused on trying to find a cure or a solution or a chemical compound to spray or to spritz or to figure out. It's not a disease that could be solved that way. It's an ecological issue. It is a pattern of how we behave as people in this environment. Like our ancestors have been tending the land since time immemorial. Why do you think many of the settlers who've come to California call it a garden of Eden and call it rich? We're still reaping the benefits of this tended garden by the indigenous peoples. Yet Western settler education and that mindset calls indigenous peoples savages, dirty, primitive. Yet how my community and my ancestors and our relatives all around us have been tending is so very pivotal. And now all of a sudden permaculture is so popular, yet it leans highly on indigenous pedagogies, yet where is the accountability? Where is the humility? And where is the reciprocity? So I remind you that when we want to lean to indigenous teachings and we want to learn about edible and medicinal teachings and, and understandings that are we being accountable to that truth that we are on stolen land and we need to be responsible because I myself as an indigenous person I cannot even engage in my environment without being stifled I can't go hunting without a license I can't collect my cultural resources without permits people have privatized land people have hoarded and they say, this is my asset. I have deed to this. And then there's new age community members who are saying, we're all entitled to this. We all deserve this. It's like, I have to be patient because we are all impacted by colonization. And I recognize that even our own relatives with European ancestry have also been colonized. Even our community members have all had indigenous ancestors that have all had earth-based spiritual teachings. And I highly recommend that people honor the past to shape the future. So that is what I try and do all the time is talk about this. So I'm glad to share my perspective here. So thank you. <laughs> Yahui. Thanks. Thanks, Kenyon. You always have such great, um, great stuff to say and a beautiful way of saying it. Um, I want to acknowledge that we have about four minutes left. So if there is any last questions that people have out there, we had a few in the, um, in the Q and A, and then you can also drop them into the chat. I want to remind people that the link will be sent out to you for the video. And we also shared it various times here on the chat as well. And Linda made it public too. So please, please feel free to share. It will be hosted on dance missions website and then also on dancing earth. And I want to remind everybody here that attended that, um, we really appreciate you for being present and I'll say yahui to all of you for coming and that um, this is just a small little snippet of collaborative work that indigenous people are doing together. And so everyone here in the circle that has joined us tonight that worked on this project um, has just an endless, endless uh, wealth of talent and creativity. And this is just a small little sample of what comes together, um, music, dance, film, storytelling, um, 
land sovereignty, uh, food, food sovereignty, and all of us living in California, you know, um, California is home to you know, hundreds of tribes and hundreds of language groups. And most people don't have um, land. Um, you know, we, most of us don't have reservation land. Most of us don't have land that is our own because it's still um, occupied. And so all of these contemporary issues that we're working on affect everyone in the urban environment, in the rural environments. And um, I know that all of us here are gonna be continuing to do this work until the days that we pass. So there's one more question in the chat and it says, um, is there, this is from Jennifer, is there anything within the colonial political world you would like non-native people to do, like a bill to ask representatives to support, et cetera? So um, I know Kenya does a lot of political work, so I'm gonna let her take this. One. I really would recommend that we um, acknowledge the United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People, AKA UNDRIP, that we consider creating committees to acknowledge the rights of nature. There are many stories how uh, other nations have, have given rights to rivers, so when we lean and look to other nations, think about First Nations Canada, there are land acknowledgements. That is wonderful. However, they have learned quickly that land acknowledgements can turn into a performative act. Where's the accountability? Thank you for acknowledging it from a simple as, let's pretend this is your cup. Oh, look, you have such a wonderful glass. I find it really beautiful and this is your glass. It's so very wonderful. I thank you for acknowledging it. Mm, we need to take action. And so, <laughs> number one, hashtag land back. What a concept. However, I also just want to say that we, <laughs> imagine if we had the um, House of Representatives and then we had like an indigenous lodge, like everything has to go through all of those parties before it ever gets passed. Can't be sure about all that. I'm not very um, government savvy along the political end. I'm just a rambunctious, loudmouth, rambling coyote that says we can talk about this and we need to have these conversations. So the United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People, the rights of nature, talk about land back, and talk about acknowledging where you are and educating your community to the best of your ability about the truth of the history of the land and the peoples because those original stewards, those original communities have a wealth of knowledge and we need to humble ourselves to be accountable. So I hope you could be in community with our community. And if not, hey, they have the right to say no, but it's still our job to educate ourselves. Nothing about us without us. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Kenyon. That was amazing. And I um, also want to hand it to Vic real quick um, to talk to a little, uh, us a little bit about the Segorite land tax and how people can support in the urban area. Vic, can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. Thank you. Oh, yeah. The way you guys can support our work, um, the Segorite land trust, is by paying the Shaumi land tax, which is a voluntary tax uh, for occupying um, unseated Huchin Ohlone territory um, here in the East Bay. Um, and I just want to encourage everybody here that's um, watching um, to look up traditional burning. I know Vernon Dad brought that up. Um, and just listen to indigenous people, you know, like um, food sovereignty, like, you know, it also has to do a lot with um, taking back all of these um, all of these medicines, you know, like and, um, bringing back that that knowledge and stepping away from like pharmaceuticals. And um, so I just kind of just wanted to to just say that right quick, you know, um, and I encourage each and every one of you to like look deep into your um, your ancestry and um, and also be very conscious of not appropriating indigenous medicine. Thanks. Thank you. That's Sheena and everybody. Thank you. Thank you. So um, we're going to wrap it up. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Thank you, Dance Mission Theater, for producing this little film and then also for supporting all of the dance and um, social justice work that you all do. And thank you, Rulon and Dancing Earth, for also supporting this and 
birthing this creative dance. Esme, for the beautiful language, I am just so blown away by your language ability and your ability to turn it into song. You do not even know how much it inspires me. I dream of that and dream of these just beautiful songs coming to me at night. Um, Bernadette, you're such a powerhouse, um, such an amazing, amazing woman. Your youth work, your culture work, your singing, and your just general badassery. Uh, I freaking love and uh, as well Vicki and um, I just I really appreciate you and every time I see your beautiful smile it just warms my heart and I love working with you on this project and Bates and I hope to work more with you on many many different projects in Canyon as well like always bringing us the knowledge dropping the knowledge and doing it in a beautiful and just direct and right and intelligent way. I love seeing all these beautiful, intelligent indigenous women just like holding up the community and also propelling us forward into the future and bringing tradition and our ancestors with us. So thank you all. Thanks Linda for producing this beautiful film, directing this beautiful little film. And um, yeah, it was so wonderful to work with y'all on this project and can't wait to do more. Thanks everyone for coming. All the links will be sent to you. Um, resources too, we have a lot of them there in the chat. And um, yeah, yeah, we. And thanks Stella. She's behind the screen on this. And she's the one that really spearheaded all of this and made it happen um, into this beautiful film that I've watched over and over and over again. So love y'all.